Welcome to the Creators Podcast. I'm Jonathan Hamill, a doctor and writer based in Paris. My guest today is Scott Rice. Scott is an Emmy Award winning filmmaker and commercial director whose clients include Shell, Subway, MasterCard, Sears, and many others. His narrative work holds a staggering film festival record of uh, 300 official selections and 85 awards. His films have been distributed on many platforms, including Comedy Central, Hulu, Showtime, Blockbuster, and PBS. Scott is also a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where he's been teaching screenwriting and film production since the year 2000. He also co-teaches a film course called From Script to Screen with the actor Matthew McConaughey. Scott had recently won an Emmy Award for the PBS series Stories of the Mind, which focuses on the subject of mental health in America. Before launching his career as a director, Scott spent seven years working as an art director, digital artist, and animator for Activision, where he was involved in the creation of many hit video games, including Soldier of Fortune. He holds an MA in Communications Art from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MFA in Film Production from the University of Texas at Austin. You can find All Things Scott on his website, twoshotwest.com. Scott, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Thanks. So I wanted to start with uh, education, because uh, it seems like it's a big part of your life uh, right now and has been for quite a long time. Uh, so growing up in Ohio and Wisconsin, uh, how did you get in contact with the world of entertainment? Was it through family, friends, or mainly movies and magazines? Yeah, it was mainly movies, magazines, books. I had no connection to the entertainment business. My father was a rocket scientist, and my mom was a homemaker. And uh, my mom was a big influence on me. She loved movies, and her dad, my grandfather, also was a huge movie fan. Mm. And so, um, you know, they they really brought me up in uh, a family that just loved movies. And uh, that was my focus. So um, falling in love with movies was definitely through the art itself. Mm. What, what's one of your first uh, movie memories? Do you remember? Well, I, you know, <laughs> well, my, my I think my very first memory is of a trailer for a movie that was playing on TV. I think I was two years old. I, I think wow. it was the, um, the re-release of Rosemary's baby. And that movie, the, the commercial depicted the camera moving in slowly on this uh, baby carriage. And there was this hairy claw hanging out of the baby <sighs> carriage. And I saw that, I think when I was about two or three years old and I was just wow. terrified. It became my first <laughs> memory. And I'm, and I'm not a huge a fan of horror films ever since then. <laughs> but the movie that really made me want to make movies, I was nine years old and I saw E.T., the extraterrestrial Steven Spielberg's movie. And I was nine years old. The main character was nine or 10 years old, Elliot. And that movie was just a spiritual experience for me. I saw that. My heart exploded. And I, you know, I wanted to have an adventure like Elliot did in the movie and I got kind of depressed that my my life in the suburbs wasn't as interesting as this kid's life in the suburbs. And my mom reminded me, it's just a movie. It's just a movie. And I decided in that moment, if I can't really have that, I want to be a part of making that magic and, mm. and making people feel that way, that exhilaration, yeah. um, that uh, that empathy, that love that you feel when you watch that film. So Ever since then, I decided at age nine, I said, I want to make movies, but I had no connection to the movie business. Mm -hmm. So it took a long, a long time to start to build that. Basically. Yeah, but it's amazing that you remember that at such a young age. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, it's a blessing to decide what you want to do at a young age because then you have less yeah. decisions to make throughout your life. You just kind of. That's true. You just you focus. <laughs> yeah, you focus. Yeah. So then, uh, so you uh, enrolled as an undergraduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and you graduated with a BA in Communications Arts with an emphasis on film, so you were already in the right direction. Um, but you were still, I think, a little, some years away from directing, right? I was some years away from directing professionally. I don't think, I didn't get paid to direct until about 2005. 
I made my undergraduate thesis film in 1995. So it was 10 years cool. before I actually got paid to do what I wanted. Although I had been paid, um, I'd gotten some of my graduate films distributed. But one of the things I tell my students is that it takes time. It takes time. Um, you know, I asked, I asked a, a director friend of mine, Tracy Lehman, who lives in L.A., how long did it take between the time you moved out to L.A. and then got paid to direct? And she mm. said about 10 years. Um, she was working as a PA. She was um, doing some screenwriting. But she didn't get paid to direct for 10 years. So it takes time. And you just have to yeah. be tenacious and you just have to be patient and wait. Well, yeah. So first you have to learn it and then you have to learn to wait again to. Well, that's I guess true. It's like it's the same, same thing for actors. They say it uh, takes like 10 years to make an actor, but then it could be years if they have a chance to, to work and to get paid. So That's absolutely true. It takes time. Yeah. Uh, so during your studies, I saw that you, you studied uh, under David Bordwell, who's a famous movie theorist. Um, in what way did uh, his lessons uh, influence your style later on when you started directing or your career in any other sense? Well, I, you know, first of all, I just want to say that's so important for a filmmaker to learn film history, to learn about uh, different movements in cinema from German Expressionism to the French New Wave, on and on. And I feel like that's where I really got my true cinematic um, education on an academic level. So I was always a fan of movies. I grew up with Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. and I loved all that stuff. But um, David Bordwell was the one who really introduced me to world cinema and how to study it, how to, how to really do um, scene analysis and shot breakdowns and, you know, understand, understanding semiotics and film theory and That was all very, to have that foundation was really important as a filmmaker, I felt. Um, how much it really influenced my style, I think that my style never changed from when I was a kid making movies. You know, I used to make on my dad's camcorder, you know, I would make these action comedies. And by golly, I'm still making action comedies. I kind of never changed as a filmmaker. I love doing things that are funny, that are fun, that are adventurous. But I also like to make things with heart, um, going back to the E.T. influence, like yeah. something that moves an audience, something that's about something relevant thematically, um, something that's commenting on the human condition. I think that always um, stuck with me, despite my sort of academic um introduction to film as an undergraduate i think i yeah. i think that didn't really influence my style as much as gave me a, a deeper appreciation for uh filmmaking yeah you were not just making it from the top of your head you had like, i guess it's like uh, you know studying classical music and analyzing it and if you want to play jazz or something you still yeah. need it. it still helps you yeah absolutely so, and and i wasn't just the other thing that was cool is You know, I spent some time as a studio art major, so I wasn't just studying film. I was also studying art, and I was um, an illustrator, and I was doing a lot of drawing and painting and sculpture um, in school as well. So I, I kind of got a very well-rounded, um, I don't know, crack at doing art, you know, on a very pure level when I was in school, mm. and not just doing cinematic art, but doing visual arts um was that uh, by by choice or was, was it just by chance uh part of the curriculum it was by choice so i you know always grew up i, I wanted to be a filmmaker but i was also an artist and i love portraiture in particular and so before i went to the university of wisconsin i went to a little small tiny private college called lawrence university in northern wisconsin in appleton wisconsin mm -hmm. And I only had the money. I ran out of money to go there. I only went there for a year and a half because <laughs> it was expensive. But I was a studio art major there because they didn't have a film program. And I just think it's interesting. You know, a lot of filmmakers think, well, I want to be a filmmaker. I just have to only study cinema and become an expert at cinema. And it's like, no, you have other interests. You have other interests in art or science or psychology or whatever. 
studied that sure. too. I also took a ton of classes in psychology. So if I weren't a filmmaker, <laughs> I would probably be a therapist and, <laughs> and enjoying and loving my life uh, just as much as I do as a filmmaker. Um, but I think it's important to have in other interests outside of filmmaking. Oh yeah, that feeds that feeds the filmmaking for sure. Yeah, 100%. not just like a machine with a with a camera. Yeah, right. Uh, exactly. So, and so uh, I guess all of that art also led you to work uh, for uh, Activision before you moved to uh, to Austin. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that came to be? Well, it's a very interesting story. It's a it's a I was in the right place at the right time type story. Mm -hmm. Um, my track coach, and who was also my art teacher in high school, um, had just started a video game company called Raven Software. And um, when I graduated from high school and I was in college, he, I, was, I was the first artist he hired on staff to work for his company. And I worked out of his brother's basement, and it was a tiny company, and they made a couple games, and I kind of did it as a college job. And then, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't grow up with money. Um, so in order to go to grad school, I just needed a job to earn more money to go to film school. Uh, and I ended up going to Austin. But when I was in Madison, um, Wisconsin, um, my, my art teacher actually sold his company to Activision. So we became a studio of Activision. Uh -huh. I was slowly promoted. I became an animator and a, a 3D modeler. And then I was promoted to um, art director. Um, so I was, uh, I don't know, 25 years old. And I had a team of about 11 <laughs> artists that I was in charge of. And it was awesome. It was a really fun time. I'm glad I got that experience. It was kind of the only real office job I've ever had. <laughs> and I'm glad so I kind of had that. <laughs> um, so what does an art director do in, in, a, in a video game studio like this? Yeah, it's very similar to what an art director or production designer does in a movie. They're just in charge of everything visual. So everything that you see on the screen, um, the art director had some kind of hand in deciding how it should look, whether it's from the characters, the weapons. You know, we did a lot of first-person shooters, so the weapons that yeah. appear on screen, the environments, all the textures that appear um, on the, the, the environment that is built by the game designers. And then the vehicles, the props, everything you see in the story world and the game world, um, you know, you're, you're working with the artist to decide how it should look. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time when I was actually doing the modeling and I was doing the animating and I was animating wow. cool like monsters and things and doing all the deaths, the, you know, and you shoot something and it blows up, you know, uh, doing all that good stuff. And um It, it was a it was a really fun job, but I was never a gamer. I always wanted to make movies. I never really played a lot of games. Mm -hmm. So it was an odd job for me. It just kind of fell into my lap. I know there's a lot of people who were killed for that job, but I didn't really have to work for it. I mean, it, it fell into my lap, and I did a good job by, while I was in the job, and that's why I got promoted. Um, but it was, uh, it was really a fun time in my young life. Yeah, and so can you tell us a little bit about your role in the uh, in the game Soldier of Fortune because that's really well known, and I think you worked on that a little bit. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean that was a big, I mean that was a big one. So you know, my role on that game, I was I was art director, and at the time, you know, games had stories, but uh, and we had in-game cinematics, but you know, no one really knew how to make them and. As a filmmaker, I really enjoyed it because I would go to the designers who were kind of animating the in-game animatics, and I and I would uh, I would I would teach them rules of filmmaking, like oh, don't cross the 180 degree line and all this stuff, and keep the screen direction consistent. Teaching them rules of continuity editing, oh, and you know, we didn't. I was the only person who had a film background, and then when it came time to have a story and a script, like no one really knew how to write a script. And I'm like, well, I do. So mm. I just would, would go home at night and write the script for the game. And wow. it's, kind of, it's an uncredited thing. We don't even have like a screenplay credit for that game, but I just wrote the script, you know, um, <laughs> Amazing. uh, on my, you know, off on my off time, even I didn't even get paid to write it really. And we just needed a script. And I was like this, well, I can do it. I'll do it. And I wanted it to be good. Um, 
in the game and the game was uh, very successful. But ironically, I had left the company and gone to grad school before the game was released. So it became this big hit. But after I had left, You're um, like I know I, I worked on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was a good yeah, it was a good time. Cool. Yeah, and it also says on your CV that you coined the term Warzone. I'm sure the, the the people who played Soldier Fortune know what it is, what this <laughs> yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, so Warzone is, um, you know, one thing I really pushed on Soldier of Fortune, and partly why it was so successful is um, it was highly interactive. So you could you could uh, shoot somebody in the shoulder, and they'd react like they got shot in the shoulder. Someone gets shot in the knee, and they go down to a knee, or you. You shoot them in the head, and then they they fall a certain way. So, and and what we would also do is we would be we would create wounds that were very specific to the zone of the body in which you hit somebody. Now, this is something that later on in my life I was not very proud of because it's just so violent and glorifying violence, and I'm not really about that. But um, you know, at the time, I realized that these games like what people like about them is the visceral nature and the violence and the excitement of it um so we're i really a push to make it as realistic as possible and in fact one of the great pleasures of working on that game is you know in the late 90s when motion capture was new um you know uh james cameron had kind of pioneered it um particularly around the time titanic the movie came out I got to fly to LA and work with Universal Studios stunt people and do motion capture for the game. So we really, oh. uh, we really did motion capture. It was the first game at my oh. company that we'd do, done motion capture on, and I got to direct the motion capture sessions. So that was that was a blast because again, like I mentioned, I love action, I love action movies and stuff. So I had all the moves I wanted to get, you know, through through yeah. motion capture and we got great stuff. And that's also partly why the game was really fun, because we I think we really nailed that that motion capture. And you were getting closer to directing also, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to, to direct motion capture, it, it did feel like directing. And that was something I was trained in. So it made sense that I was the one that went out and did that. Yeah. So after that, you so you moved to uh, to Austin, right? So um, what can you tell us about your time at the University of Texas? Uh, was that was it there that you really learned your craft, or was able to, to practice more? I was able to practice more. That's why I went to film school. I um, you know, I didn't have the money to just make my own films. I had to pay that tuition to have access to the, to the equipment and collaborators because you need. It takes more than one person to make a movie. So that was the reason I went to film school. And it was before like digital cinema was really common. We didn't have cameras on our phones at that point. So I felt like I really needed to go to film school to have access to film cameras. And we were still shooting on film. Um, so that's why I went to film school. I had a great experience in graduate school. I did make, I did pivot a little bit. So I learned some lessons on my undergraduate films while They did, they, they did go on and, and go to some film festivals and things. And in fact, that's how I learned about Austin was I went to a film festival there. But I decided, you know what, you know, as an undergraduate, I'd made a 30 minute short film and it was very, had a lot of dialogue. It was very talky and it had a lot of locations and a lot of characters. And I really bit off more than I could chew. And when I went to film school uh, on a graduate level, I decided I'm going to make much shorter films with fewer characters, with fewer locations, and little to no dialogue, because I also learned I'm not talented at writing dialogue. I'm much mm -hmm. more of a visual artist. Um, so I made much more visual films, and those films were very successful. Um, and that's what helped me kind of get an agent and get my directing career up and running um, in grad school, that I pivoted And I leaned more into my strengths than I did when I was. I mean, that's also smart that to recognize that it's not easy. Yeah, I mean, I really had to kind of look at myself and say, "Well, how can I do better? And how can I get specific about how I can do better?" And and uh, it paid off to to make a to make a switch. Yeah. Did you have uh, teachers or a teacher who who helped you notice that, like, make help you? make the, the films shorter and less dialogue no you know that was that was a, that was something i came to myself having 
um, as an undergraduate, made a movie that was really hard to make and took two years to make. And it was all edited on a steam back, you know, on film, you know, the old style uh-huh. way. I mean, that also didn't help. Um, and then and then going to film festivals and sort of seeing that my movie was as a 30 minute film was actually hard to program because mm-hmm. it was so long. I didn't realize. I mean, no one I'd never gone to a film festival. No one had told me that it was better to make shorter films. They're easier to program. They take up less real real yeah. estate, you know, at the festival in terms of time. And uh, I kind of noticed my my film was being programmed before features, and but it was too long to really be in front of a feature, and it was just a weird length. Hmm. And um, I, I just noticed, and I was like, man, these other films that are shorter, that's the way to go. And I, hmm. I just need, just on a pure production level, there's just too much to do if you've got multiple la- locations and a ton of actors and a ton of plot. It just I, I really tried to hone in on stories like the first film I made when I was a, a grad student was it was a four minute movie that takes place over the course of four minutes. So it takes place mm. in real time in a bedroom, uh, in, a, in a husband and wife's bed in the middle of the night. One character's awake, the other character's asleep. And uh, these two people have very incompatible sleeping habits. <laughs> and the one person's keeping the other person awake. So it was a bit of a comedy, but in the end, it's really about incompatible sleeping habits and unconditional love and what we'll put up with when we love someone. So I, I tried to figure it out, like, you know, how can I tell a small story, but that has a big idea, a bigger, broader mm-hmm. theme that comments on the human condition? And that was very and that was very successful. And that played all around the world. The film was called Pillow Fight. And um, I learned so I learned early on in my graduate filmmaking. Ooh, yeah, that was a good move. You know, no dialogue, yeah. <laughs> almost no dialogue. Um, sure very is. visual, visual storytelling and, uh, you know, a playful tone, a short running time and one location. Mm-hmm. And I shot it in the studio. I didn't even shoot at a house. I just built a couple flats and yeah. made it how look much like time a did it take to, uh, to shoot it? I'm sorry? Was it, how much time did it take to shoot it? Uh, probably about eight hours. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Wow. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm trying Shorter to remember. Shorter than two years. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no. The um, Yeah, that's better than two years. So, yeah. The, the two years, you know, was how long it took me to shoot and edit and finish. Pillow fight probably took me a month or two. Yeah, it was over and done pretty quick. Yeah. So what year was this? Uh, that film I shot in the year 2000. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to get to something I saw on your, your resume, which, by the way, is very long. It's like 15 <laughs> pages long. So, yeah. But yeah. something that <laughs> stood out was... Uh, Uh, and I quote, so you made his Oscar history in 2004, so four years later, when you became the first person to be named as a finalist in two categories in the same year for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Student Academy Awards competition with uh, two uh, movies, The Adventures of Mad Matt uh, was a finalist in the documentary category, and your thesis film, Perils in Nude Modeling, was a finalist in the narrative category. So that was at the after your studies. Okay. That was yeah. Those films were nominated. Yeah, just after. Yeah, just after. Right around the time I graduated. Um, and one was my pre-thesis film, which was a documentary film, and the other one was a narrative. That was my thesis film, and mm-hmm. apparently. Two two films made by the same filmmaker had not ever been not nominated in that same category or had never been a finalist for the Oscar student Oscars um, in those two different categories in the same year. And so yeah. I got some attention for that. And that, boy, that was great. It was really cool to have these two movies I made I'm sure, uh, both yeah. become finalists. That was awesome. So was the the Adventures of Mad Matt was not Matt uh, Matt McConaughey? <laughs> no, I wish it was. Um, no, it was actually my brother Matt. So when oh, I was a kid, I, I think I mentioned I made movies when I was a kid. So over a ten year period, I made these action comedies starring my brother Matt, 
And we decided because we loved Indiana Jones and, you know, um, Rambo and all these action movies. Um, we decided to call the character Mad Matt after Mad Max. Um, and we pretty much grew up on video camera making these movies. And so the Adventures of Mad Matt, the documentary, is a personal documentary about my childhood as told through the movies I made as a kid with my siblings, not just my brother, but with my two sisters as well. And it's very much a story of growing up and growing apart and the, the, the sadness and the tragedy of kind of losing your childhood and growing up and your relationships kind of change. And um, the film was very successful on the festival circuit because it was about filmmaking. It was about family. And it was um, about love and about loss. Um, and, and, and funny enough, I said, I want to make shorter movies. Well, that movie was about 26 minutes long. So yeah, was it was a little <laughs> on the longer side, but it, but it worked. That's the length that needed to be. There were cuts that were longer, like in the 35 minute range. So I did kind of get it down, but, um, it really played well in front of an audience and it holds, I sometimes, I just showed it to my wife's family and they had a lot of fun watching it. It, it <laughs> still sure. holds up. Cool. So, so once you get all that attention, um, what was there a lot of opportunity uh, after the the student Oscars? Um, there were, I mean, there there was some attention. So I I got I, I got an agent out in L.A. and I was started doing um, general meetings at, at in L.A. And for people who don't know what generals are, generals are just when you go to a studio, you meet with a creative executive and it's just kind of a general get to know you like, hi, nice to meet you. You know, it's not really about any specific project. They certainly ask, what are you working on? And then you can pitch a couple things, a couple ideas you have. But um, I went out and did generals. I had the opportunity to put myself to up to direct a few films, but they were, they were films that I, I ended up not going for because I didn't love the scripts. These are movies that did get made. And um, I kind of decided I was also an editor at the time. I was so before I earned money as a director, I was editing and I was out in LA editing this, uh, this independent feature film. And I just didn't love living in LA. I love LA. I love visiting LA, but something about being from the Midwest and being used to a much kind of smaller city and living in LA, it's just so big and the traffic is so crazy. I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay in Austin. And I kind of decided to forego some of those opportunities I had in Hollywood and build my career in a different way as a regional filmmaker, as a Texas filmmaker, and eventually start my own company here. And was that uh frequent at the time for people in your uh, position with you know opportunities and to decide to move out i think that at the time people were more inclined to go to la and stay in la because of the way the business was back then this is pre-streaming this is pre really you know it being easier to make films with digital cameras and things like that i mean now you can make a movie anywhere and you can try and get it distributed um, at the time, it was a little bit more New York and L.A. You kind of had to be there. Um, so I, I think it was a little bit of a risk to stay in Austin, although Austin has a long history of filmmakers who have stayed here, like Richard Linklater and you know Robert Rodriguez lives here and makes mm. movies here still. And so there was sort of that. It, it, it did make sense in my mind to stay here and try to make it work. And it has worked, and I'm grateful for it. Yeah. So when uh, when did you start uh, your your production company, uh, Scott Rice Films? Was that around that time? Yeah, I mean, Austin? Scott Rice Films was the first company I started. That was probably around 2008, I would say. Um, I had done a uh, a web series called Script Cops, which is a comedy <laughs> sketch comedy. Uh, series about cops who arrest people for bad screenwriting so um it was just a you know a parody of the show cops basically with screenwriting jokes and movie jokes 
and I had done that and uh, Sony picked it up um, and wanted me to do a, a second season. And so I needed to start a company to be able to produce that mm -hmm. in a more official capacity. Um, so that's when I started that company, yes. Yeah, so and this company uh, did the screenwriting, directing, production, everything? How, how did you... Yeah, yeah. So whenever I, you know, did a, a job, like if I, if I um, rewrote a script or wrote a script or did an outline for someone and got paid for that, that, that went through Scott Rice Films, mm. LLC. Um, whenever I directed for another production company, um, that also went through the, the same company. And it started out as my production company, and it was the company I produced that second series of script cops through. But then I decided to start a second company called Two Shot West, which was geared more toward commercial production. And I started that in uh, 2012. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. How many uh, commercials have you made? Do you know? Do you know? <laughs> I did count them once and I put I wrote them down in a bio somewhere. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I would say around 300. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, can, so can can you can you give us a little idea of what the process is like um, for let's say for a commercial? Does the company come with uh, with the idea, uh, with yeah. kind of ideas? Just we're looking for a technician, or is it a collaborative work, or does it depend? Sure, I can explain that. So in the commercial world, instead of having a studio that's hiring you, it's an ad agency that's hiring you. So the ad agency is effectively the studio. The ad agency has created the commercial script. And so they went, they went to advertising school. So they know how to write advertising, but mm. they didn't go to film school. So they don't know how to produce it and make it into a commercial that can play on television, for example. So they go to production companies and they say, hey, um, here's our script. Tell us what you would do with it. And the production company, you know, bigger production companies have a number of directors, what they call on roster. So the directors kind of direct for that particular production company. And the production company will show the script to a director. Then the director comes up with a, a pitch, a treatment, a written treatment as well, and basically pitches their take on the commercial. The ad agency then usually has three directors slash production companies kind of bid on that commercial. They also have the production company give a budget. And mm -hmm. the production or the ad agency looks at the budgets looks at the creative treatment and the pitch that the directors presented and pick, picks a director slash production company um, to work with. And then it is a collaborative um, environment. You have a creative director that works for the ad agency, who's kind of like the director, but for the ad agency, mm. kind of making sure the director isn't doing anything that's off brand or stylistically right. not right. But usually when the creative director and the creative team and the agency picks the director, they know what they're going to get. They've looked at their reel. They're like, that's what we want. And so usually it, it goes pretty smoothly. And in, in my experience, it's been a really good collaborative experience. And as a, as a commercial director, you know, I'm not making the commercial for myself. It's for the ad agency. It's for that client, that brand, whatever it is. Or in the case of a PSA, maybe it's a nonprofit or a state agency. It's theirs. So I, I create yeah. what they want, you know, I, and I'm very communicative. I kind of share my ideas and I'm very transparent about what I'm going to mm. do so that there's no surprises and they're yeah. happy with the final product. Um, so that's how I work as a commercial director. I see. So, very, so different from if it was your project and your vision, very different. It's very different. Yeah. It's, um, you know, in the case of, you know, writing an independent feature, it's, it's kind of nice because you get to write your own movie and whatever. But, you know, at some point you're going to have some boss. You're going to have someone who's paying for the movie, a studio you're working with. Some, you're going to have to answer to somebody. And somebody's going to have some probably some creative differences with right. you. And you've got to kind of work that out. And it's kind of the same in the commercial world in, in that respect. So I want to switch a little bit and talk about uh, mental health because from uh, 2014 to 2018, you oversaw the creative direction of the Mental Health Channel's website and you also worked as a director and creative director for the Emmy Award winning 
PBS series, Stories of the Mind. Um, so how did you first get involved uh, with this project and why was it important to you to get involved with this project? Yeah, um, Harry Lynch, who I'd gone to school with, um, who, who was, a, was a graduate screenwriter at the University of Texas, had started this company called Arcos Films, and he had this project called the Mental Health Channel, and he needed a director to come in and start directing some episodes, and he called me up, and I said, I'd very much be interested in that. I have always been interested, like I said, I would be a therapist if psychology. I were a filmmaker. Yep. <laughs> so I was always interested in psychology, always interested in, in mental health, partly because I'd always struggled with depression in my own life, like a lot of artists do. I have, you know, what you call dysthymia, which is a low grade constant depression. And um, so I said, yeah, I want to do that. And I just found it endlessly fascinating to meet people who you know, are struggling with very serious conditions from schizophrenia to um, bipolar disorder and, um, and, and really, you know, living very vibrant, healthy lives. Um, they've overcome. And in meeting all those people, boy, all my problems just felt like, oh, oh, I'm, why am I embarrassed? I shouldn't be embarrassed to talk about my stuff. Mm. Um, these people have the strength and the courage to, so it emboldened me to talk about my own mental health stuff, to encourage other people to talk about their thing. And we all have our own thing. We all have our own issues. And um, so it was, it, was a, it was a wonderful project. It also gave me an experience to do more documentary um, because I always considered myself a scripted kind of movie director, a, uh, a narrative director. And I hadn't done, I'd have done a little bit of documentary, but not a ton. But after that, I'd done a ton. And, and um, there's a, is it, sorry, is there, so there's more creative uh, opportunity in, in documentary because it's unscripted? Well, I feel like the opportunity in documentary is to roll with what you're given. And what I mean by that is, you know, as a narrative filmmaker, I would show up to set and I want everything to go my way and I want everything to go perfectly. And I don't, you know. And in documentary, things just, you don't have that much control. You know, there's a, there's a lot more variables in terms of what you're going to shoot, how you're going to shoot it, what the subject is feeling that day, all that good stuff. And, you know, the flow of emotions, you know, in an interview, for example, you just can't predict it. Mm. It's, it's much more spontaneous. So I feel like, you know, practicing making documentary film made me a better narrative scripted filmmaker. Because I'm much better at, well, oh, it, it's raining and we needed a bright, sunny day. Oh, I know how to adapt to that. Because yeah. in documentary, you're just, all you're doing is adapting. Um, so, you know, stuff always go wrong, goes wrong in filmmaking. You have to trust the process. And it's really more, you know, your strength as a character is how you're able to take the limitation and turn it into a positive. Yeah. And I feel like I got better at that for having done documentary. Right. And it's also kind of a psychology work. <laughs> anyway, you have to adapting to everything, you know. Oh, so well, you it know, all and comes that's, together. <laughs> it's a mental health thing. It's like, well, you're on set, something goes wrong. How do you keep from getting frustrated, <laughs> you know, yes, and, and, and allowing people to see you frustrated? I mean, all filmmakers struggle with that. And I feel, I feel like the most professional. And the most, I, I remember when I was a, an undergrad, an actor told me one time, Scott, you're just a pillar of stability. And I said, pillar of stability. I love that image of this pillar and it's immovable and it's just always kind of the same and it's always there. And I've tried to be that pillar of stability throughout my career as much as I can. I'm not perfect. But um, as much as I can, I go back to that imagery of being a pillar of stability. Hmm, nice. And when you say it emboldened you to uh, talk about uh, mental health, uh, was how, where did you um, talk about it? Was it just with the, your family or did you uh, actually like, give interviews or talk with your fellow directors or uh, actors? Yeah, because I guess more... in, the, in this uh, in this industry where there's a lot of you know, very famous people, is there like a stigma about talking about mental health because it can you know get on the news, etc.? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There there has been and still is a stigma 
but it's waning. Um, and I feel like, um, you know, part of our mission at the mental health channel was to fight the stigma and to undermine the stigma and to normalize talking about mental health. I mean, we talk about our physical health. What is wrong with discussing our mental health? Um, our brain is an organ, just happens to be the most complex organ in our body, but it's an organ nonetheless. It's physical. Um, so why can and, and there's a connection between physical and mental. Why can't we talk about it? And I think that, you know, what happened for me was having, you know, done so many interviews and done so much work with people who are really struggling with mental health issues and seeing their strength. Um, I just was emboldened myself. So I would talk about my own issues publicly in, in like an interview like this, mm. right. That we're having right now. Yeah. Whereas before that, when I was doing an interview, something for the newspaper or something on camera, I would never bring up something like that because I felt ashamed. <laughs> you know, I felt ashamed that I struggled with depression and that shame just kind of melted away. And now I talk about it. And I think that the more we talk about our own stuff with our families, with our friends, and publicly, the more we normalize the discussion, the more the stigma starts to go away, and um, the better things can be. Because the more we talk about it, the more likely we are to get help for those and, of us. Yeah, and to help other people talk about it, and they get Absolutely. help. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So I want to get back now to... Uh, education and teaching because uh, as we were saying in the beginning it's a big part of your life because you've been teaching at the university of texas since since uh, the year 2000 right as a graduate teaching assistant correct uh, yeah intro to screenwriting uh directing commercials um to you was it a natural progression uh from being a student to teaching did you find it easy or did you enjoy it right away well <laughs> i enjoyed it um, I am a, I'm a naturally very shy person. So the idea of getting in front of a classroom and having to talk to people or to give, go up in front of a hundred people and give a le lecture was very intimidating. Um, and I think it was a survival instinct when I was a, a graduate student, I was like, well, I'm going to graduate in, uh, you know, a few semesters here. What am I going to do for money? Well, one thing I can do is I can teach. So I took my, my teaching assistantship very seriously. And I asked my professor, um, you know, for example, I was, um, I was a teaching assistant for a screenwriting class. So I had my own small section of like 12 to 15 people. And that was very fun um, to actually, I was nervous at first, but I got used to it pretty quickly. Just workshopping the student scripts. Boy, it was awesome. But the scary thing was getting in front of the whole class of about 100, 150 students and giving a lecture. <laughs> and I remember my first one. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time looking down at my notes, you know, <laughs> you know, and you're Sweating. relying on that crutch. <laughs> and um, but I got used to it over time. And because I had volunteered to give a lecture. My, my professor, um, my supervising professor was like, let's hire Scott to teach this class. So mm -hmm. the semester after I graduated, they hired me to just take over the whole class. And boy, mm -hmm. I was ready to go because I was taking notes and I was kind of like preparing myself to teach. Mm -hmm. It was a very conscious choice. Um, and then after I did it for a semester or two, it became very second nature. I was less nervous. And I come from a long line of teachers. My mother was a fourth grade teacher. My two grandfathers were um, high school uh, uh, physical education teachers and football coaches. And so I think teaching is in my blood. So it comes very naturally to me. But I did have to get over my stage fright uh, when I yeah. started first doing it. It probably helped you also with, uh, with directing because you were in charge of, I suppose, a lot of people. I mean, yeah. it's not a lecture, but still. Well, you know, you know, directing for some reason, directing never made me too nervous because you're, I'm on such a mission, like I'm on a storytelling mission and I just kind of get possessed with that mission of telling that story and getting the shots we need. Mm -hmm. 
And there was something that came very naturally about directing, whereas teaching, teaching is more uh, cerebral. Like directing is very much visual. It's more like art. It's more like sculpting. Mm. Teaching uses a different part of my brain where I'm, I'm using um, language and I have to communicate just right. And I have to, you know, plan the lecture, you know, develop the lecture in a way that is uh, easy to digest. And it's, it's just, a, it works a different part of my brain mm. than directing. So it took a little getting used to, but I tell you, there's nothing more fun than teaching a subject that you love that you guys could just talk about movies all day and all night. And yeah. I get paid to talk about yeah. movies with students and teach all this knowledge, particularly knowledge that I didn't learn in film school. Like the lecture I did today was all about like onset lingo that I never was taught in film school. So I, it's yeah. really fun to say, here's all the stuff I learned after film school. Yeah. And so you sure, guys really are a little bit closer to the industry than I was when I graduated. So that's, that's really fun to, to share things that I learned in my professional career. Sure. And speaking of being close to the industry, you also teach a class, uh, I think since 2015, uh, a producing class uh, with uh, Matthew McConaughey. Um, so at that time, he was already a very famous actor, so I suppose very busy. Yeah. Uh, how did that uh, come to be? What, did he come to you? What, what did you already work? Were you working before before that together? Yeah, how, I what's did. The story. Not, I did, Yeah. What the story is is that um, the chair of uh, my the film program, Paul Steckler, um, at the time, this was probably 2014, 2013, saw Matthew at a party at a, I think it was a university party and said, hey, Matthew, if you got involved with the film program, what would that look like? And Matthew said, yeah, I think I think it'd be cool to be a part of a class called Script to Screen. You know, I've made 50 movies and maybe I got something to share. Maybe I got some <laughs> knowledge to share. And um I guess, the, the, you know, the department didn't really hear from him for a year or two. And then he uh, he called up the department one summer and said, hey, I'm shooting Free State of Jones down in uh, Louisiana in the swamp. Send the students. Let's do the class. And the <laughs> department was like, oh, uh, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> so they called me, um, who I kind of I had a reputation of starting. Um, new classes, and I think they thought I would be a good fit with Matthew. So I got on the phone with Matthew, and uh, he just basically did a brainstorm of all his ideas for what the class would be. This is while he was shooting Free State of Jones over the summer of 2015. And then I went to Louisiana. I, ha I, I had a mental health um, uh, channel project I was shooting out there, and he happened to be shooting out there too. So I went out there, went to set, Matt Gary Ross, uh, you know, who, who was the writer director he was working with and talked to Matthew and got some more of his feedback about what the class would be. And just in the course of a couple of weeks, I did, I developed a syllabus for what the class would be. And that very fall we were teaching it. Um, and it was great. It was great. So free state of Jones was the first film we studied. Um, and it was long before the film even came out. And uh, it's been a really fun model for the past, uh, what, going on nine years, I guess. Yeah. So you, so you basically study films that he, he is shooting where he has shot and yes. do the analysis? Yes. And some of them, I mean, the whole idea behind the class is that, you know, we study the films before they come out. So, you know, um, I think the, the next, four, you know, one of the next movies we worked on was uh, The Beach Bum with Harmony Kareen. Um, we did the Yan Dimash movie, White Boy Rick. Um, you know, we we did uh, Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman. Hmm. And then we have worked in some kind of classic films that Matthew's made, like Days and Confused with Richard Linklater and uh, uh, Mud uh, with Jeff Nichols. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, we've we've studied films that he's actually been in production. Oh, wow. So, so the you film go to set. Yeah, well, we haven't, we, what, what he does, so a lot of the films haven't been shot in Austin. It's just logistically difficult to get yeah. students to set. However, what Matthew does 
is he he brings a uh, behind the scenes uh, videographer to shoot instructions from set. So he teaches from set, and so does the director. And then we play that video in the class, and it's just it's just remarkable. Amazing. Yeah, it must bring yeah. so much to the to the students. Oh, it's great, and it's exclusive to the class. No one else sees this footage, <laughs> and it's um it's amazing. The students all sign NDAs and they read the script, you know, before the movie comes out, and mm. oftentimes multiple drafts of the script. So it's very instructive. So we go through the whole process. We go through the development process. We, they see a rough draft, early draft of the script, then a mid level draft, and then the shooting script, and then we look at storyboards. And we discuss pre-production. And then we basically go on to set via video with Matthew and the director. And then we also see early cuts of the movie or at least early cuts of certain scenes. Um, And then if the movie's finished, then we also watch the final film at the end of the process. And they really, it is really script to screen, you know, during the entire production process from development, script development to editing. And then we also touch on marketing and distribution as well wow so it's a pretty unique class i take it yeah it's a unique class it's um you know i would consider it an advanced producing class but because it's matthew we're talking a lot about the actor director relationship so it's a great class for directors as well it's also a great uh, a great class for writers because there is so much script development involved in what we discussed in the class Wow. And, and what was his motivation that they talk about this with him uh, to do this? He just that he's just love teaching. I think he just thought it'd be fun. He's like, <laughs> I've got some stuff to share. I love my alma mater, University of Texas. Yeah. Um, he likes being on campus. He has a real heart for students, both uh, kind of high school students. He has a, you know, a nonprofit organization um, called Just Keep Living Foundation that uh, has after school programs for at risk um, high school students. And it's an awesome program. And he's a very active part of that. And I think he thought it'd be cool to get involved with uh, college students as it relates to filmmaking and teach some filmmaking. I mean, he graduated from the film program at the University of Texas. Mm. So um, yeah, I think I think Matthew just he has a great heart. He's really an awesome role model, like for real. Like it's not just his public persona. Mm. He's the real deal. He's he's very much a loving man, a family man. He loves his kids. He loves his wife. And he loves doing good for the community. And this is all a part of that. Yeah, I saw the, the video for his 50th birthday on, on YouTube and with the messages of the, the students and You could see he got, he got really emotional, so I I can see why he like he really loves teaching because he doesn't have to obviously. Right. No. It 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 means something to him. He every semester students write these thank you notes <laughs> to him, and he reads them all. He gets so excited to get that feedback. Um. You know, it feels good to help others, and this is kind of a broader lesson that I kind of tell my students. Um. Go ahead. Reach out. Ask for help. Ask her. Ask for advice. Don't hesitate. Don't feel like you're bothering someone because you know what? You probably made their day because it feels good to give advice. It feels good to help somebody. Um, and Matthew, more than almost anyone I've ever met, understands that. It just feels good to be of help. It's good for the soul. And as much as you can do that, I encourage people to do that. Love it. So I was thinking as an artist, we've talked a bit about other forms of art. Uh, these days, what are your primary sources of inspiration? Are you still looking at art, comic books, movies, theater? Yeah, in terms of the films I'm developing, my inspiration tends to be my life. So I write, you know, personal stories about my relationships, family stories, um, friendship stories, romances, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Um, so I, I enjoy that in terms of what I read, I read a lot of nonfiction. So I read a ton of mo- books about movie making. So I just finished uh, this book called the making of star Trek II: the wrath of Khan, which is probably my favorite star Trek movie. And they never had a book come out about it. 
Um, I had a friend of mine uh, give to me for my birthday, The Hidden Life of Trees, which is a, a book just about the the, yeah, the biology the of that. trees. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I love it. Um, and, you know, in terms of the media I consume, you know, I'm, I'm more of a movie person than a series person. I don't watch a lot of episodic because I don't want to watch something for 10 or 20 hours. I'd rather just watch a two hour movie and a condensed story. I, I love the narrative economy of feature filmmaking because you just, you just have to be so efficient with your story information, what you include, whereas a series can be longer. And some yeah. people love that and how it's stretched out. I don't so much. I, I really prefer, I just prefer the, the feature film model. Um, however, I, I am enjoying Ahsoka. And in fact, tonight is the season finale of Ahsoka. So oh. I'm going to watch that. I <laughs> love the Star Wars stuff. I'm shooting a virtual production um, job coming up in a month. Uh, so we're going to be on a volume, the biggest um, volume in the state of Texas. And it'll be my first time shooting virtual production. So I'm really interested in how Lucasfilm and uh, you know Marvel and other these big Hollywood films are being made virtually on these you know on the, so these sets. What is vir virtual volume. production? Sorry. What yeah. Is so virtual production is a a means of shooting in a studio, um, and creating you know a, a foreground set, but the background instead of shooting against green screen like we used to do with big movies in in, in uh, you know even just a few years ago. Instead of the green screen, we put up an LED wall where we literally have an image of the background on the wall. Oh, and uh, we, we shoot that with the camera, and it's all captured. The background is, in, is captured in camera, and the light from the background reflects off reflective surfaces and, and glass. So it's very convincing, and you don't have all that post-production work you have to do to composite in a background after the fact. And here's the video game connection. The backgrounds are run by what's called the Unreal Engine, which is a video game engine, but is now used in movies to create virtual backgrounds. So whatever the camera is doing, the background knows to move in relation uh, with oh, that okay. camera. So it's very, it's advanced technology. It's used in big Hollywood movies. It's starting to be, and, and TV shows. It was pioneered on the, the show, The Mandalorian. It was really the the first yeah. show to use it and it made production much more feasible mm. and brought costs down. Um, so I'm, I'm learning that technology. I'm directing a piece uh, on a volume uh, you know, doing virtual production in a month. And um, that's uh, really exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, is it something you wrote? Uh... It's something I wrote and developed. So basically um, The uh, studio called Stray Vista Studios, uh, again, they're the largest uh, virtual production stage in the state of Texas. They wanted to do a demonstration. So they wanted to uh, fly in people who are interested in learning more about virtual production. And we needed something to shoot. So they came to me and they said, hey, um, come up with an idea that we could shoot. And I came up with a kind of Indiana Jones themed the Goonies themed kind of kid adventure um, that's all about imagination. So it's almost like a little short film um, that we're going to shoot virtually and have three different environments, a city environment, a cave environment, and a jungle environment. And we're going to do some action on the virtual production stage. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. And yeah I hope to do fun. more virtual production in the future. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much, Scott, for taking the time to be here. It's uh, it's been great. Uh, once Thank again, you. people can find everything on your website, uh, twoshotwest dot com, or Instagram at Scott Rice Director. Um, so thank you everyone for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation and would like to hear more, don't forget to like, subscribe, and spread the word. And you can find everything about this podcast and my activities as a writer on my website, Hamel Jonathan. Dot com. Thank you all, and see you soon on the Creators Podcast.